We will continue with chapter 7 of the Bhagavad Gita. The chapter is called Jnana Vijayana Yoga and we are at verse verses 8, 8 to 10. I'm going to first um, comment on verses 8 to 10. I am the flavor in the waters, O son of Kunti, and the radiance of the moon and the sun. I am Pranav in all the Vedas, the sound in space and the manliness in men. I am beautiful fragrance in the earth, the brilliance in the sun, the living force in all beings, and I am ascetism in the ascetics. Know me to be the ancient seed of all beings, O son of Pitta. I am the wisdom in the wise and the splendor in the splendid. We can see a trend in these verses if you contemplate among them. Then you see that Sri Krishna is saying that he is the highest. If we take the example of the radiance of the moon and the sun, we say, what is the quality of the sun? It gives light. It's the most important quality for those of us who are here on earth. We see the sun, we see its light, we see its radiance, its warmth, and this is the most important quality. If we speak of earth, those of us who have experienced the beautiful fragrance of the earth <clears throat> with the first coming of the first rains after a hot summer, we experience that a lot in India, <clears throat> then after a very long hot Indian summer, the first rains come and we have this beautiful fragrance of the earth. And that is a quality which is very, very special. So, this is the most basic fundamental quality that we are referring to here. Sri Krishna is talking about being that foundation, being that basic quality. And what is that? That is pure consciousness that permeates, permeates everything around us all the time. It's everywhere and in fact we are in it. If you think of a seed, that seed, out of that seed can come out a mango tree, out of a seed can come out an apple tree, out of a seed can come out an oak tree, a different kind of trees. But if you break open the seed, what is in it? Apparently, nothing. You don't see anything special in it. But we know that in that seed, there is something that brings forth life. It is, life is there, but in its potential form in its latent form. And that is the ancient seed of all beings and everything around. What is that? That is pure consciousness. These are very beautiful, mystical words. Poetry. <clears throat> A way to help us understand that Pure consciousness is like the juice of all things. It's the life behind all manifestation. It's the ground on which all of life grows from. Or the screen on which all films are projected. 
So this is the meaning of these three verses here from 8 to 10. This is a beautiful description of pure consciousness. Any questions so far? I have um, separated these, these verses um, in different blocks, the block of three, because they fit better together in that way. It's easier to explain that. So we move on to verse 11. I am the strength in the strong, free of desire and attachment. I am the desire in beings, which is not opposed to righteousness. Did somebody just want to ask something? I, I was not sure whether I heard something or not. Yes, Radhika, I was trying to ask some questions. Oh yes, go ahead. Uh, some clarification, one is on... Uh, uh, the, I am Pranava in all the Vedas, uh, in the, also in the ninth uh, shloka. Mm -hmm. I am ascetism, so uh, basically the... Yes, it is essentially the same. Uh, what is the, the quality of an ascetic? It is ascetism, right? Uh, um, one who is a renunciate. What is most predominant quality in an ascetic? The fact that he is practicing ascetism or renunciation or tiaga. That is the most predominant quality in that person and so you'd say that is the core the heart of the matter and that again is the same as saying I am the light in the sun I am the fragrance in the earth I am the radiance of the moon what about pranav pranav is om and all the Vedas, as we know, are full of many mantras, many shlokas. Some beautiful shlokas coming from the Vedas, such as the Gayatri, and many, many others. Yet, he says, I am Pranav in all the Vedas. Pranav is the highest of mantras. Why is Pranav the highest? For various reasons, but I don't want to elaborate on... Um, Om right now because that would be a subject on its own. We would of course be doing that when we would discuss eventually the Mandukya Upanishad. But to make it short, Om is the finest of all mantras because it is a word for the universal self. It is a sound or a word that indicates the universal self. The cosmic self, Brahman, different words for the same thing. And so it indicates that once again, I'm the highest of all scriptures. I am the, the deepest, I'm the finest, I'm the best, I'm the most dominant quality. And the juice or the heart, the core of all matter. So, it is these three verses bring across the same thing. It just does it using different examples. Okay, clear? So, verse 11, I'll repeat once again. I am the strength and the strong, free of desire and attachment. I am that desire in beings which is not opposed to righteousness. What is strength? I am the strength and the strong, free of desire and attachment. So it defines strong person not as 
somebody who will who can lift 50 kilos or uh, 100 or 200 kilos you know like they do in the olympics they have this uh, weightlifting sport so this is not about being strong in a physical sense strength is that one who is free of desire and attachment and once again following the same pattern this verse says i am the strength in the strong and i am that desire which is not opposed to righteousness so a desire on its own is not a bad thing in our normal spiritual conventional spiritual way of seeing things many of us have been told desire is a bad thing or oh, it's not good to have desires the purpose of yoga is to be desireless so what does that mean we assume if the purpose of yoga is to be desireless therefore desire is not a good thing it's a bad thing and so many misguided seekers as well as teachers go around saying i have no desires that is not possible it's not possible <clears throat> Uh, Sumit, did you want to ask something or, or was that just background noise? No, it's noise. Okay, can you mute yourself or I can mute you if you don't know how to do that? If you can mute me, that would be better. I don't have the mute button. Okay. So this idea of desire is has been warped and most people believe that desire is something bad. What, however, is the case is not that desire is bad. Desire is the reason why we are here. Desire is the root. So we speak of karma, it is not refer referring merely to sexual desire, it's not referring to carnal desire, it is referring to the root of which is within us or the seed which is within us which always sprouts. And these are samskaras. These are the little seeds in us that sprout and make us go out into the world. These samskaras or these seeds or desires lead us outwards every time to a new birth. As a death, you go back to the latent form and once again, at some point of time, the desires stir up and there is a rebirth so that you can live out these desires. Another reason why a lot of people say desires are bad because desires are the cause of this cycle of birth, death and rebirth. But if we think logically, desires that lead to righteousness desire that would lead us to withdraw from this cycle, help us on our path, is a desire worth cultivating. Desire which does good, for example, to help somebody in need, to do good work. Why would you not want to do that? What is wrong with that? If we are here to live out our desires, ultimately, is it not appropriate 
to live out with desires, to help others, for example. And so, karma is often misunderstood. It is very important that we learn to understand that desires per se are neither good nor bad. It depends on what we do with them, whether we allow them to manifest or not. And if we do not allow them to manifest, how are we going to deal with these desires? Repressed desires can be very harmful. So how do we deal with these desires? Repressed desires cause deep conflicts in the mind. They are unhealthy and lead to lead us further away from our path. Once again, this is a, is a topic which is um, deeply involved with the practice of meditation and we learn about the importance of desire really when we start practicing and we see these desires in ourselves and at a very practical level we find out that you have a desire for something and the desire is not met you get angry. When the desire is met or is fulfilled, it may lead to pride, it may lead to egoism. The desire is not fulfilled, it can lead to jealousy and anger and also ultimately egoism. And this strengthens these samskaras again leads to a leading to a vicious cycle we keep coming back again and again and we are not able to find a way out and many people who begin very sincerely on this path wanting to succeed wanting to develop get stuck here because they do not know how to break this cycle Okay, hey, any other questions on this? Any comments? Good, okay, in that case, I will continue and read verses 12 to 15. As I mentioned that uh, I'm grouping them slightly differently since they fit better together. All the sattvic states, as well as the rajasic and the tamasic ones, originate from me. Know them to be thus. I am not in them yet they are in me. This entire world deluded by three states, constituted of gunas, does not recognize me as the immutable one beyond them. This divine maya of mine, consisting of gunas, is difficult to transcend. Only they who surrender themselves to me go across this maya. The basest among human beings, the deluded ones, evildoers, do not surrender to me. Their knowledge 
having been plundered away by Maya, as they have resorted to a demonic aspect. These verses, as you may have already heard, are about the gunas. Another word for gunas uh, is prakriti <clears throat> from the Sankhya system of uh, Sankhya school of philosophy and it's also Maya from the Vedantic school. There is no real difference between the two. So what are the gunas? The gunas are classified into tamas, rajas and sattva. The word guna itself, gun means quality. So there are three qualities that have been described here. Three main qualities that can be used to describe anything. You can say food is tamasic, sattvic, rajasic. You can refer to nature, character, I mean, a person's character as tamasic, sattvic or rajasic. So this is Sankhya metaphysics. Everything can be described as the three gunas. The mind is made up of these three gunas. It's the basic elements. These are the basic elements which then later get specified into the antakarna, the four aspects of the mind, the four functions. But before the four functions, far more rudimentary or far more fundamental is the distinction of the three gunas. Just like in matter, you would say that there is fire, space, water, air, earth. This is a way we would study these. Similarly, all of nature, entire universe, comprises of these three gunas. The moment we experience the gunas, it is like a veil. It's like veils before us, which don't allow us to see things clearly. And because of these gunas, we are unable to transcend or recognize that behind all these gunas is pure consciousness. And it is that which is the true life giver. This is pure consciousness which is really behind everything. But due to the veil of the gunas, we are unable to see through this. The most ignorant of people, evildoers, their knowledge or their buddhi is completely lost because they have given in to the demonic aspect which is tamas. So they become very tamasic and therefore they cannot at all see wisdom, they cannot see knowledge, they cannot see pure consciousness that pure consciousness is everywhere. These verses explain us the play of consciousness. It is the play of these three gunas, tamas, rajas and sattva, which make the world the way it is. This play would cease were it not for these three gunas.
Nothing can stop the gunas. That is the nature. That is prakriti. The wise one transcends, goes beyond these and becomes a witness. Gets identified with the immutable one, the unchanging one. Gunas is not an easy subject to understand because it is very um, subtle. We can relate very easily to the elements of space, water, fire, earth. We can relate to the senses. We can even relate to manas, buddhi, chitta, and ankara. These are the four aspects of the mind. But we do tend to have some difficulties relating to the gunas. Towards the end of the Bhagavad Gita, it goes into further detail with the gunas and uh, describes them in, in greater detail. So we need not go into further detail here. But if you have any questions about gunas or something related to that, you're most welcome to ask your questions. All right, we continue uh, with the next verses. Uh, there's a question from Matthias. Is Guna related to Ganapati like Gana? No, it is not. Gana comes from the uh, servants or the... Yes, servants, I call them, of Ganpati. They were um, the different aspects that, that worked for him. They were part of, basically part of um, the world, you can say, yes. But uh, he's not lord of the gunas, but lord of the ganas. And that is different from here, from this. Will the gunas affect the jnani? Shibu asked. That's actually what I was trying to explain at the, at the end. That nobody can control the gunas. Gunas is not something you can control or coordinate. We can coordinate, for example, the different aspects of the mind. What does it mean to coordinate? We learn to how to uh, help them work as a team. We can... We can unlearn certain habit patterns, we can purify ourselves a little bit. So to an extent, you can say that over a period of time, when we evolve spiritually, we evolve from tamats to rajas, eventually to sattva. A tamasic person is known as pashu. They're very strong animal tendencies, you know, Primitive tendencies, such a person is called a Pashu. Rajasic person is known as Veera. That is a person who is, you know, very active, can be aggressive, very active. There's a lot of movement. And a Sattvic person is known as Divya or Divine. So what you want is through a spiritual evolution that can take place over not just one lifetime, but many lifetimes, you're evolving from tamasic life forms 
towards more eventually sattvic life forms. And that's a progression that takes place over perhaps hundreds of thousands of lifetimes. So a journey, you can say, is probably more sattvic than others, but that does not mean that the journey does not experience gunas. He witnesses the gunas. He doesn't experience them like any other person would do. He becomes a witness. He only observes them and he says, hmm, oh, that's amazing. Isn't that wonderful? This is all such a wonderful miracle. This is so beautiful. This is the play of consciousness. And he is no longer identified with the gunas. And Shibua so will sadhana help to, to remain in a sattvic guna. The initial process of sadhana is to purify and acquire more sattvic qualities. Eventually, yes. But even sattva is one of the gunas, remember. When you are established in pure consciousness, only then are you beyond the gunas. That is self-realization. So, verses 16 to 19. Four kinds of people, performers of good deeds, devote themselves to me, O Arjuna. The distressed, the seeker of knowledge, the seeker of fulfillment of a wish, and the one who knows, O bull among the Bharatas, of these the one endorsed with knowledge, ever united in yoga, with single-pointed devotion, is distinguished. I am most beloved of the one endorsed with wisdom. And he is also my beloved. All these others are excellent, but one endorsed with knowledge is my own self. This is my view. Such a one whose self is joined in yoga, is established in me, consequently in a state higher than which there is none. At the end of many lifetimes, one endowed with knowledge attains me, knowing the indweller in all. Such a great souled one, Mahatma, is very difficult to find. There are four kinds of seekers, essentially. Why did you come to yoga? What triggered your interest in spirituality? Why are you asking yourself questions like, Who am I? What is this universe made up of? Why are you asking questions like, what will happen to me when I die? Is there rebirth? What kind of a seeker are you? Are you the distressed seeker? The one who asks these questions because you have suffered. Those who have suffered a certain loss. Maybe the beloved one died, somebody close to you died. Perhaps you're suffering because of uh, poverty, because of illness or disease, because somebody in your family is 
uh, ill or dying because you have been rejected in love. There are many different kinds of sorrows. And that is a certain kind of seeker. Those who have suffered a lot, who have experienced deep sorrow, they also ask themselves, why am I suffering? I'm a good person, but I'm suffering. Why is this happening to me? And these kind of questions lead you to deeper, deeper spirituality. Then there are those who are seekers of knowledge. They may not have any other reason for, for asking these questions. It's not like they have suffered something. This is one of the highest quality of seeker. This is an adhikari. Some of us know the story of the Buddha. He was a prince. He was young. He was handsome. He had everything. But he kept pondering over questions like, what is age? Why are some people poor? There's that famous story of the Buddha, you know, as he goes out and he sees somebody who was sick and somebody was dying, he was beginning to ask these questions to himself. Mahavir, the saint of the giants, was also from a princely background. Lord Ram, who in the Yoga Vashishta asks deep and profound questions to the sage Vashishta, is a young prince, he's only 16 years old and he is not lacking in anything. He was wealthy, he was handsome, he was a prince, he had everything anybody could want and still he asked these deep questions, these profound questions. Who am I? Why am I here? What is my purpose in life? This is the true seeker of knowledge. He is beginning to contemplate deeper matters without actually any particular reason. You can say that this is a kind of a scientific curiosity about the world around you. This is indeed a privileged birth birth of somebody who has gone through many, many lifetimes, an old soul who then asks such profound questions. The third kind of seeker is one who wishes fulfillment of certain desires. So, you know, there are those who go to the temple or to the church or to, to the mosque and they tie a little um, thread at the tomb of a saint or they go and make a wish and they say if I get such and such thing I will um, worship you and um, these are people who wish their desires to be fulfilled so you may wish for a partner for a job to get rich, to win in the lottery. You may have a desire to, to get into a certain school or a certain university, to get a promotion. These are the kind of desires that people have and they go to places of worship and they ask for these to be fulfilled. This is a very low category of seeker because there's always wanting something. So we say that they are like beggars. You keep wanting something, you know. This is not a true seeker. The highest among all seekers is the true seeker of knowledge. He asks these questions 
because he wants to know. And the fourth is the one who knows. This is the one who has already attained something and he is devoted to the Lord because he has seen that this is the highest, that there is nothing beyond this. He has experienced that reasonless joy. He has experienced that eternal beauty which is within, perhaps just a little drop of it. But a drop is already enough to cure you of lifetimes of ignorance and set you back on track on the right path. So the one who knows is devoted only to the highest, to pure consciousness, to the universal self. Because he has seen it for himself and nothing that you say can convince him otherwise. And such a one is the most beloved, is the most privileged and beloved. The others are also good, but the one who has attained a little bit, the one who is a true seeker of knowledge, is the highest. We all go through that process of evolution, if not in this lifetime, then in another. Just do not give up. Keep doing your practice, your sadhana. Nothing is lost. It all accrues to you. When you have evolved to a very high level, you may attain a very privileged birth in which you will unfold these qualities and continue to seek and eventually attain and be established in that knowledge, in the one who rests within. Of course, such a person, such a soul is very rare. They are called Mahatmas, great soul. Any <clears throat> questions so far? Yes. Who was that? Uh, this is Balaji. Oh, uh, yes. You mentioned about the three Nas. Mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, and also referring to Shibu's question of Adani uh, experiencing about the three books. Yeah. Uh, is it a uh, 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 kind of enlightened person still goes through all these Gunas and just be aware, being aware of uh, this Guna? Uh, you mentioned, yes. Yes. There's a lower stage when you can control. And these are the siddhis, when you can control things, where you can, through the power of your mind, you can uh, strengthen certain aspects and... You can even change the future. You can see into the future, change the future, you can read minds and many such things. But you can be lost in the Siddhis. That's not the highest path. The highest is the attainment of self-realization, which means you become established in the self and a witness of 
everything. And that means witnessing everything, not controlling everything. Therefore, the journey would merely witness and say, hmm, okay, the gunas are pretty cool. He would not attempt to control the gunas because that would be an act coming from Ahankara. Okay? So Mita asked, are all these gunas coming from our thoughts? So I hope that answered your question, Shibu. Um, sorry, uh, Balaji. And Mita. Okay. Uh, the the Jnani will still experience all these gunas, but he will be just aware of uh, all these gunas. That is part of his. Yes, because he's witnessing. He's not experiencing the way you would experience. You see, it's a it's a problem with words. You're using the word experience. You experience things because okay. you have. Ahankara, you have manas and you're looking at things from a mental level. But a jani who has attained, who is established in the self, he, he is always witnessing. So he doesn't experience things the way you do. Right? So okay. that's why we, we, don't, we don't use the word experience for jani because that, that's actually not even an experience. It's nothing that we can relate to. Yes. Okay. And as Shibu now writes, we experience singleness because we have a body. It's not only because we are identified with the body. We have a body and the gunas will always be there. But if you're not identified with the body or with the different aspects of our mind, we are identified with, with Atman, then you don't experience but you witness. Let's, of course, not get too lost with the words. It's okay It's uh, if you don't understand everything at this point of time. It'll come. I just wanted to mention shortly for Mitha, who had mentioned here, all the gunas come from our thoughts. No, the gunas don't come from the thoughts. The thoughts come from the gunas. The other way around. Mm -hmm. So, uh, we can, like, uh, like, the quality of thoughts can be, you know, changed. Yes, buddhi itself is ultimately uh, also can be tamasic, rajasic, or sattvic. And what does that mean? A sharp buddhi, which is able to cut through everything, is a sattvic buddhi. But a buddhi, which has not been... You know, there's so much darkness in the mind. Ahankara is so strong. Manas is untrained. Chitta is full of all sorts of emotions and coloring. Buddhi cannot see through all that. So that buddhi is not sharp. That's a tamasic buddhi. So that purification first needs to take place and the buddhi needs to get sharper. So buddhi itself is a part of the gunas. It is the most sattvic part of your mind. But even then, it may be a little bit tamasic compared to, say, the buddhi of a sage, which is very sharp. Right? So if you compare your buddhi with the buddhi of a sage, one would say, yes, both the buddhis are sattvic in nature, but relatively speaking, the buddhi of a sage or a jnani is very sattvic, very sharp. Okay? Thank you so much. We will also be coming back to the gunas in the later chapters of the Bhagavad Gita. It again talks about the gunas, as I mentioned earlier. So, in that chapter, we will go deeper into it. Okay. 
so Okay, verses 20 to 23 of chapter 7. This is actually a very short chapter, so I don't know, maybe we can finish today. Let's see. Many, their knowledge plundered away by so many desires, resort to their deities. Undertaking this and that observation, impelled thereto by their own nature. Whatever form or aspect of mind a devotee wishes to worship with faith, toward that very form or aspect of mind, I establish his unshaken devotion. Endowed with that faith, he endeavors to practice the worship of the same. Thereby, he gains the fulfillment of those very wishes provided by me. But the fruit of theirs whose wisdom is thus limited, comes to an end. Those who sacrifice to the deities go to the deities. Those who are devoted to me come even to me. Who is me? Me, as we have mentioned before, is not Shri Krishna a, de a deity? This is not referring to a blue-skinned god who dances with the gopis with a flute in his hand. No, this is not referring to a deity. Me is Sri Krishna, a representation of the universal consciousness. This me is pure consciousness self and one who identifies with pure consciousness speaks like this. Some sages and saints from different traditions have spoken like this and have said, I am God, Aham Brahmasmi. And people have said, oh, this is blasphemy, this is shocking. But for those people, this was the reality because they were identified with pure consciousness. They were not understood by the others and they were persecuted, even tortured and killed because of the ignorance of the people. So those who are ignorant, what do they do? They are filled with desires. They have many samskaras. These cause a veil the, the, of, of the gunas. This is very active. And because of this ignorance, they are unable to see clearly, unable to understand clearly what is right, what is wrong, what is right, what they should do, how, should, how they should act. So they are impelled by their own nature. So that means... The samskaras which are there manifest because that's how it is. These samskaras are so strong, these desires are so strong that they come forward. And so some of these people worship deities because they want their desires to be fulfilled. And those who worship the deities, that's what they get. They get their wishes fulfilled. But these are very limited. This is not lasting. So you wish for a good partner, you get a good partner perhaps. But then you want to have a good job. Then you want to have children. After that you want a house, you want a car. These are very limited. It's always something new. And so those who worship deities are lost in this cycle of wishes and desires. They get lost in this external worship and they become beggars. Don't be a beggar. Those who 
those who are devoted to pure consciousness self itself will attain that. This is a divine promise. In a sense, we always get what we want. And some of you may immediately say, hey, that's not possible. How can we always get what we want? I want to be rich, but I'm, I'm not getting rich. I want to be healthy, but I'm very sick and, and I'm not getting healthy. How can this be possible? But it is true. If you contemplate a little bit, you will see that there are some unhealthy thinking patterns which block you and limit you. A one-pointed mind can help us fulfill these desires, live them out and then go beyond. In the Indian tradition, we have many little um, symbols for this. Symbol is, one of them is the Kalpa Vikshu, that is a Kalpataru, sorry. Kalpataru means the wish fulfilling tree. Then there is the cow of Sage Vashishta, known as Kamadhenu, the wish fulfilling cow. Krishna had a gem that fulfilled all wishes, Chintamani, the wish fulfilling gem. Why all these? ideas in the different scriptures about wish fulfillment because as we get more and more one-pointed our desires manifest and are fulfilled that is one of the ways we speed up our process of purification those desires that can be fulfilled are fulfilled and those that cannot be fulfilled must be renounced. And so if you desire wealth and career and job, if you have a one-pointed mind, you will get that if you're on the path. And those who then eventually grow out of that and recognize the futility of these limited things, they go beyond and seek the highest. These wishes, or they become obstacles. And that is why when we spoke shortly with Balaji, I said, there is such, such a thing as cities. You can acquire siddhis on the path, but the siddhis themselves become an obstacle. So to go beyond the siddhis and attain the highest, which is pure consciousness, is our ultimate goal. But power, desires, Fulfillment of these desires is very enticing, very tempting, and it can seduce you, and you can be lost in this self, in this wish fulfillment. So, one has to be aware of that. Any questions so far on this? Good. Everybody's wishes have been fulfilled and everybody is very content. We don't have many more verses to go for chapter 7, but I think it is best to stop here because the next 
six verses are very interesting and I do not want to rush through them. And so we will continue the Bhagavad Gita, chapter 7.